Hello, and welcome to the webinar, How to Create Influencer Partnerships. My name is Philip Smith. I'm the Head of News and Content at Decision UK, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this, the first Decision UK webinar of 2017. Happy New Year. It's always tempting, and often wrong, to say that a subject area needs no introduction. But in this case, I think it's safe to say influencer marketing is one of the most talked about and exciting areas of marketing and communications at the moment. However, thanks to the speed of its development, influencer marketing can be a confusing area as well. Well, at Cision, we don't think it needs to be an inaccessible, difficult or confusing subject. And today we're going to focus on how you can create influencer partnerships to help your own communications. The webinar is going to look at how you can interact with influencers, how they like to be contacted, how you can create mutually beneficial partnerships, and how to boost your own messaging with influencer marketing. It will also look at ideas like how you can spot a rising star, how you can build your own credibility in this space, how you can write a compelling email, and how to grow your own brand on social media. There's a lot there, so I'm delighted to say I'm not on my own. I'm joined by two guests, Claire and Lorna, who want to help us demystify influencer marketing too. But first, let me tell you a little bit about them. Claire is Claire Etchell, also known as Naked PR Girl. She's a London-based luxury PR and brand consultant with deep-rooted influencer experience forged over 10 years in the fashion and lifestyle industry. It's safe to say with her own blog at nakedprgirl.com, which features some lively content and interviews, she is a PR influencer in her own right. Lorna is, of course, known as Lorna Lux and can be found at lornalux.com. She describes Lorna Lux as a lifestyle blog dedicated to providing style inspiration for fashion-savvy young professionals. And in her own words, this is a fashion blog which I use to share my outfits and long-term commitment to shopping, this life-sharing business I've taken to like a duck to water. I'm overly social so long as I've remembered my iPhone charger. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, and most recently Snapchat, if you want me in the raw. Lorna Lux is an Instagram regular, um, and she says she's living by her breathe it all in, lux it all, like, all out mantra, and sharing with her collective of 410,000 eager fashion and luxury lifestyle enthusiasts on a daily basis. Uh, I have to say, Claire, on her own blog, wrote my favorite description of Lorna Lux. Lorna Lux has burst into my life like a perfectly formed, Seriously well-dressed stick of dynamite. So, on that explosive note, Claire, Lorna, welcome to the webinar. Thank Hello. you. Hi. Overwhelmed by that. I know. <laughs> Quite an intro. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Claire and Lorna are going to kick things off with a short presentation in a minute. Uh, we've got lots of info in this presentation. Just a few slides, I warn you, but lots of info. And, of course, we'll share the slides and the recording of the webinar afterwards. Um, They'll run the, the webinar like a tag team, really, on that presentation, um, with possibly the odd interruption from myself. Uh, but what we'll do is we'll make sure that we have time for your questions, too, and make sure there's a good 10 minutes of Q&A at the end of the presentation, at least. So please use the panel on the right-hand side of your screens to send in your questions, and we'll try and answer and give you all the answers on influencers um, and help me put Claire and Lorna on the spot. <laughs> so, I look forward to hearing what you all want to know more about, and I really look forward to hearing what Claire and Lorna have to say. So, Claire, can I ask you to start the presentation? Of course. Um, so, first of all, we're going to talk about uh, how to network and reach those rising stars. And um, so, we're going to talk about how Lorna and I first met. So, Lorna, how did you get on my radar? It was definitely very much me hustling Claire. So. You know, as an influencer in the early days, it's really important for me to network specifically within London because I'm a London-centric blogger. You were on my radar because you were kind of PR in brands that I had in my game plan. And so I found you in areas other than email. So I looked for your Twitter, your Instagram, and I followed you and I engaged and we became friends. We did because I found my first email to you after a few months which said, Dear Lorna, um, I feel like we're already friends because yeah. we've been talking on social media. Yeah, absolutely. So we've co all, already cultivated step. quite a strong mm. sort of appreciation for what each other did. Obviously, with 
in, in the way we did it with Instagram, it's quite visual. Mm -hmm. So I already had quite a clear idea about what you were about, what you liked, what you didn't. And therefore, it was a really nice way to meet, I'd say. Yeah. And then since then, so we've gone on to do um, photo shoots together. We have. Uh, we've done um, events. Yeah, we've done um, a few events now. We've done quite we? a few events. You've hosted Q&As in stores. Yeah. Um, interviews. Yeah. And oh, through, bang. But through that, I think you've really sort of identified my strengths and my weaknesses. <laughs> um, and so it's been quite handy for me going forward to sort of grow my own brand. That because we've networked on those levels, you know where to put me, where to keep me away. Yeah. Um, so actually, you're really you've become almost my PR as well as you know PR in the brand. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And that to me is a that's a great um, relationship. And you yeah. said that you would um, you kind of always reply to emails if you've got some kind of social media relationship with people before. Yeah, absolutely. So there's, I have this rule, which is that if I've seen somebody engaging on my social media, specifically Instagram, because that's where I really do study the comments and it's really important for me to know what people are saying, if I recognize somebody is consistently engaging with me on social media and then they email me um, and maybe their email is completely irrelevant, maybe they call me their blogger, but if I recognize that name um, in the email bar, I will respond to them. So that's just a personal, yeah. That's really good to know. Yeah. So I think actually for any um, anyone looking to cultivate a relationship with an influencer, it sounds like such a trite thing to do, but, it, you know, just regular engagement on their social media it's will get you on their radar mm -hmm. before they even realize you're on their radar. And then, so how do you think you spot a rising star? When does an influencer start to become... So I have this theory, and this is just me personally, so I don't know, I don't think I speak for everybody, but I've always believed that if you're um, looking for influencers on social media, because let's face it, as an influencer, social media is all the outlets really, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Specifically on Twitter and Instagram, I always find that if you've been engaging with them, following them, watching them for a long period of time, um, it almost becomes like um, a club of people. You will see the same people engaging. You will see the same interactions. Mm -hmm. You'll quickly suss out who their friends are, mm -hmm. you know, what influences they mix with, who they go to events with. And, in, you know, in my opinion, I feel as though you almost... We've, I've talked to this <laughs> before, but I always use the analogy of the film Point Break, which is that Keanu Reeves, he, um, you know, wanted to hustle the surfers, and so he became a surfer himself, and he effectively, you know, spent time with them, learning the way they work. And you kind of have to do that with influencers. We are like a very tribal, um, you know, we do have certain people we like and we don't like, and we don't, you know, we do like things done in certain ways. It's a very strange industry to work in, mm. and I'm learning, like, daily. But I feel as though the, the best, and the, the most successful <clears throat> PRs that I work with and brands are the ones that understand how we are as a collective. Mm -hmm. And usually they know that because they you know, they spend time engaging with us on social media. And then there's, um, once you kind of have one influencer that you're working with, mm -hmm. I've found that you've really introduced me to a lot more influencers. Yeah. So it's through you. So um, it, it's that circle. So it's a nice thing to pick almost one influencer. Absolutely. Get to know them. And then, you know, they will open the door to other people. It's very organic that way. I think it's organic, but also it's really strategic as well, because I feel as though you could maybe identify an influencer that is, you know, in your opinion, top, top mark influencer, maybe a little bit out of your league in terms of how much you can afford. Mm. Are they even interested in my brand? Maybe my brand's an up and coming, a new brand. Um, but that doesn't matter. If you've identified them and then you've worked out, almost like peeling off an onion, of all the circle of influencers that are around them, it might be worth, you know, catching on to the, the lower tier influencers that are still in their same circle mm -hmm. and then hustling your way in that way. Because nine times out of ten, we all end up coming across one another through a series of events, you know, social media, tri tribal. Um, so it would never be... What I would say is that, you know, when you and I met, I had fairly, you know, irrelevant following on my social media. And luckily, I, I grew. I grew really quickly. Mm -hmm. But you've also become aware of people. I, the first time we ever met, I introduced you to an influencer who is the same. She's okay. now somebody that you're working with. So I did. It's very true. Yeah. But at the time, she was effectively a non-influencer. Yes. So, yeah, that's true. yeah, always be aware of the fact that, you know, it's worth looking at a group of people and just because the, the big 
the sort of the big king of the jungle mm -hmm. might seem so unapproachable, that doesn't mean that you won't eventually get to them. Mm. And then there's a lot to be said, I think, for like in real life networking. Mm. So going to those events, um, you don't have to go to every event, do no, you? Oh gosh, no. But in you fact, want sometimes to. it's a bad thing to <laughs> yeah. go to every event. Like having your face everywhere. Yeah. But I always think it's like the Bridget Jones mentality, whereas you know, you kind of say, no, oh, you know, this is Mark Darcy, he's a top barrister. Yeah, and you introduce, so good at this. I do like doing that, yeah. So I'll always introduce people with a little bit of like a background. So, you know, usually at an event, it's good to meet people. And even if they're not in your industry or perhaps, you know, they're working for a makeup brand mm -hmm. or a hair brand. You know, you might work together later on line, you know, if you find an alcohol brand or, you know, that's always handy to keep hold of those people. Um, so it's just, yeah, making sure that you're constantly trying to kind of grow your reach. So in do you real feel as though well. every time you meet somebody and you're in a, in a group of people, do you always make a point of introducing them and also adding a, a tagline about what they do? Yeah, I'm really annoying. I do it all the time, yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, especially if, it, um, if, if um, you're at an event with me and I know there's a journalist there, yeah. I will intentionally make sure that they know who you are and okay. vice versa. Yeah. Because it's, um, it's a nice thing to do. It's a yeah. good influential thing. And they know that you're, you know, you're important, like in a different sphere. Yeah. Like, no, it, is, I mean, it can actually point a conversation as well, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Okay, I need to use that more. Yeah, so let's <laughs> do, do some tips on that. Okay, so we're going to pop on to um, expanding your blogging knowledge now. And we're just going to talk about um, business and from a brand point of view, because that's kind of where my um, background is. Um, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about making sure that um, it's digital is not just part of, just something you do on the side, it's something that's part of your business strategy and business plan. So you don't just kind of want to fire off and go and do some Facebook advertising for no apparent reason. You want to make sure that you know you've got an actual campaign. You've done your research. You've done plenty of homework on it. Um, so in that sense, we're looking at uh, making sure that you need to know your objectives. Whether you're looking at exposure or brand awareness, um, or content sales. Um, you might be looking at bloggers just to get exposure, or you might actually be looking for link backs. And they're all things that really. If you don't understand what those things mean, it's really important you go and learn about digital. And that's the next kind of point, really. We wanted to talk about how um, we got to grips with digital because it's not the traditional way. We didn't do a course. Mm. Um, I got lucky and um, got um, a digital agency working with me called NetLeads who gave me a crash course. Um, but before that, I didn't really know what SEO meant and I spent a lot of time worrying that someone would ask me. Um, but now I do know what SEO means and it's made my PR life a lot easier because now I understand what I'm doing. Um, but Lorna, how did you learn about digital? I'm still learning every day. Um, I certainly didn't know anything about link backs or that when um, certainly one of my first blog posts went live, I remember Mattress Fashion, somebody from there, head office writing to me and saying, oh, we've seen you've mentioned Mattress Fashion. Why don't you include a link back to the website? And I never really saw why that would be of value in any which way. And of course, we now know that you know Google Analytics is based on reinforcing websites. And you know, I've learned, and so I look for link backs myself. I sometimes request it when I collaborate. Mm -hmm. I ask the brand to give me a link back, um, and it's all self-taught for me. Mm -hmm. But because my business is primarily built on um, attention and how much attention I have. My focus will always be fundamentally social media mm -hmm. because that is where I can create attention and drive it. <clears throat> but I, you know, I'm not dismissing um, websites, and I, mm -hmm. I know that they pay my bills. It's very important that I write blog posts and that I collaborate with brands in that way. And do you look at your numbers? In but, Google? Yeah, I do. I really study Google Analytics, and to the point where I actually now have somebody that works with me on my SEO, and we consistently tweak. Um, my website to suit the Google Analytics rhythm mm -hmm. because the algorithm changes so frequently, um, and I don't know how from a I don't know how you go about keeping an eye on that. Like I said, I just hire someone to do it, <laughs> but I think it's really important to know about that. It is, and to look at where your traffic's coming from and what yeah. your content's working and not, so you can keep adjusting what you're doing. Yeah, and even like the age, you know, certainly the age on of the viewer and the reader on my blog is very different to my social media. Is it? And it's very rare that a brand will ever ask me that question. 
Interesting. And yet it's so important because if you're strategizing for a marketing campaign that's solely on Instagram and, you know, maybe you sell, you know, a product that is geared towards the higher end, you know, a bigger spender mm -hmm. and maybe my Instagram is more, you know, not as geared to the luxury end as maybe my blog is. Mm. It's just, a, it seems like such a simple question and yet not one that ever gets asked that often. No, do you think that means that people don't know to ask you that? I don't know because um, there could be so many variables on that. Maybe it's that they just want the content creation and that I'm valuable anyway in that yeah, sense. Different way. But um, sometimes it's not in my interest to question it. Um, but I don't know. I think it's, a, it's the kind of question that you would ask. You always ask those uncomfortable questions. I really do. I know. I'm sorry. Um, but that's, you know, that's why we've got such a strong partnership and why we work together consistently. Mm -hmm. And then um, we were just going to talk about um, brands who are starting out mm. and they're looking to kind of, you know, build their social media and they're quite worried about it. You kind of say a really good thing to me about people not worrying so much about numbers but worrying about credibility and integrity instead. Absolutely. I think if you are a brand and you have an Instagram account or a Twitter account and it doesn't have very many followers, I don't think anyone's ever going to look at you and go and judge you on it. Mm. What they are going to judge you on is if, say, for example, it's a mess, it's visually unappealing and it doesn't represent your brand and your identity. And so I think if you're doing, as we said before, engaging and, you know, you've got a tone of voice as a brand and you're consistently engaging with the, you know, the influencers that you want to then work with, um, as long as the aesthetic and everything fits is aligned with your brand, your um, integrity and your credibility will always stay. And as from my perspective, when a brand writes to me, it's the first thing I do. I check all of those mm -hmm. channels to mm -hmm. see that they're all aligned. Because it's something that I have. I think, well, if I have to do it, why wouldn't you mm -hmm. do the same? Um, I come at it like a brand head. You know, if if you, you it's almost um, it's almost actually a it's one of those deal breakers for me actually working with a brand that doesn't know who they are. It's kind of like housekeeping, isn't it? Making yeah, sure it's that almost, yeah, everything's it ticked off. It's a basic. Yeah. So it's really important. That's good. And it, I, from my point of view, from a brand point of view, um, I definitely see the value in investing in professional photographers. Um, you know, I'm really lucky I work with people in-house that are professional photographers and the level of content we can get through because we've got that level of expertise is, is amazing. And the best thing about being able to take high-res images is not just for social, it can also be for your blog, for your website. And they can be then re repurposed. You know, I've had images be used in like Stella magazine and New magazine. So it really is that like almost long game. You're not just looking at, oh gosh, what we're going to put on, on Twitter today? Quick, somebody run around with the iPhone and take something quick. You're looking at, you know, creating a strategy and creating some content that's got some longevity. Yeah, absolutely. And that's it. They're so valuable. Um, com the, the great influencers out there right now, specifically in London, that I rate the highest are the ones that are content creators as well. They don't just have a voice. They are also able to bring imagery to the, the party. Yeah. That's really valuable. Um, you know, like you say, it, it can be repurposed. It will help them grow. It will help you grow. Um, you know, there's a lot to be said for the, the reason why Instagram specifically is so successful is because it is an image-based platform and people are very visual. I don't know if that's just a trend or if that's the way that, that we live our lives now. Mm. But we want the instant gratification of seeing an image and having a connection to it. So if you're looking at influencers who maybe necessarily aren't creating great content um, in terms of the assets, that would be a concern for me. Yeah, I think it's a concern on both sides, isn't it? As a brand, you wouldn't link yeah. up with somebody who's not looking after their yeah, side and vice versa. Yeah. I think an influencer like that is more of a journalist mm. than a um, you know, social media yeah. star. Oh. <laughs> um, so then on to uh, looking at creating those mutually uh, beneficial agreements. Mm. Um, it, it does tend to be like there are things you can get both ways from the brand to the blogger, uh, but it's really um, it's really easy for brands to be like, oh, what can we get? How can we, you know what can we get from this? And it's all about them. So it can be very like me, me, me. Mm. Um, whereas I tend to approach it a bit differently and look at how you can work together. Um, what have you got, Lorna, that you do? I think that it's always like you say, we, when we first met, there was no sort of, there was no goal. It was just, I really appreciate what you do. You, I like the way you are as an influencer in the industry. I think you're going to do well. And so you, you liked what I did. And then when the time was right and you had the project that suited what I was capable of doing, 
you connected. So maybe that's a great thing, you know, throughout any brand out there right now should be doing is just identifying the influencers they really appreciate, regardless of whether or not they want to work with them or need to work with them. Mm. Because I feel as though you, once you've cultivated a strong um, network of influencers, PRs, then, uh, you know, junctures in the in the business, you, you can find routes in which you can work with them. Um, the, the sort of cold calling um, kind of email, you know, the sort of begging letter um, email that, you know, we need to do this collaboration and we need you to do it and, you know, we're going to gift you something and you have to show it on all your platforms and link back. You know, it's a, it's just not a natural way of, you know, of doing business. Too much. And um, from my perspective, it's just not a great, it's not a great opening, you know, relationship. No, we've talked to, um, talked about having that one blogger that you can get to know, but it's almost like rather yeah, scaling it back, isn't it? Rather than firing that blanket email out to everyone yeah. and saying, let's do this, just like thinking of smaller target lists. And I mean, let's working. be honest, we all have goals, we all have agendas, but I think that if you are, you know, if you can seduce an influencer the way you would seduce, you know, a lover or a partner or a you friend. Brad Pitt then. <laughs> you know, you've got to look at it as a long game and, you know, really connect with them and um yeah, it isn't a case of, you know, I want to buy you a drink and take you to bed tonight. It's you know, it's the same with influence. It's not I want you I want to send this email and for you to I want to send you a pair of socks and for you to wear them and share them on your Instagram. It's it is too um raw and it doesn't work, in my opinion. Yeah. And there's also, um, I, we do a lot of, you know, events, trying, you know, not just events, but experiences, trying to give influencers something different to go to or, you know, a different slant on something. Yeah. So it's being creative with what you're doing as well rather than just be a blogger, wear these socks. Yeah, it's trying to find ways to make that interesting and something they would want to take part And in. also knowing that most influencers, specifically the stage I'm at in my career, we're business people. You know, I run a business. And, you know, I like to be treated and respected as a, as a business person. Mm -hmm. So I want you, I'd rather you wrote to me and didn't call me darling. And, you know, I want there some form, form there has to be formality. But um, it's, much, it's much easier for the PRs that maybe have known me for a long time to be able to, you know, gosh, you can text me I and say, hey, you. what are you doing? You know, that's the kind of level of relationship we have. Yeah. And I have that with other PR um, brands. Um, but yeah, I think it's just, it really is a, a thoughtful thing to maybe sit down and write a template email of how you're going to approach because the people that you should be writing emails to are people you should be know, they should know who you are already. Do you think it's because people feel like they know you from social media, that mm. they feel familiar with yeah, you maybe. and that's the over familiarity? Absolutely. It's very often that PR will say, oh yes, I loved those shoes you were wearing the other day, you looked amazing. And it's lovely, I, I loved hearing stuff like that. Well, fundamentally, we've never met. I don't know who you are, and I've got to judge your business based on this one email. Mm. So why not draw it back a little bit? You know, let's connect on social media. Let's actually get to know one another a little bit, and then boom, go with the email. Yeah, the, the hit rate will be far greater. Yeah, we have talked about that first email as well. That you know, being relevant, being concise, including some facts and figures. You might not want to throw everything right out there straight away, yeah. but just making sure that you've got things in there and it's not just super woolly. Yeah, um, it's like fundamental business. You know, it's in, it's interesting because, like I say, well, I'm interested in it. And also, silly, you know, if you've got a really bad Instagram, don't maybe don't point that out. Don't even link to it. <laughs> you know, it's the, you know, focus right. on the things that are positive. You know, almost PR yourself in the email. Um, you know, like they say, um, it take you know, it takes a kidder to kid. You know, it's almost like I'm. I I'm do kidder, this. Kidder. Yeah. So mm. it's like I know, I know. I need to say all that I know. Yeah. And if I don't, I'm going to spend the next ten minutes finding out. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have the two things. Oh yeah. That you say if yeah. if if someone uses these <clears> two <throat> phrases in an email, then they go automatically delete. Absolutely. And so they are, do you want to read them? I think you should read them, but I need to explain okay. myself when you say so, um So the first one is, as you can appreciate, as a brand, we don't have budget. I actually don't have an issue with brands that don't have budget. I actually have a rule that, you know, I'd say 20 to 30% of the business that I do at this moment in time is not paid for or sponsored. Um, again, I can see the long game, there may be some, pro you know, a proposition further down the line. But I think for an opening line, for, to even be saying that in an opening email, it feels very 
um, it's, it's, a no, it's a negative question and it has a negative spin on it. Mm -hmm. And I think that we shouldn't be even at that stage yet. You know, it's a little bit like going into that bar and saying, I can't afford to buy you this drink. You know, it's, you just don't need to say it. And so it feels a very, um, it's a no, just never say that. Okay, that's a no, that's a no. And the second one is, we've never paid a blogger before, but we're willing to pay you. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm not, I'm not your guinea pig. You know, I've been, you know, working my, you know, butt off the last what, how many months, years, whoever the influencer is. And I feel as though that, again, is one of those sort of negative, you know, yeah, we're not really, we're not, our heart really isn't in this, but, you know, we're going to give, we're going to take a punt on you. And if it fails, then you're the reason. And it's very, it's just got a negative, um, you know, it almost sounds quite naive as well. Um, so, yeah, that's my other non. I don't don't like that do one. those. Yeah, then. I don't like that. <laughs> Um, so then just on to, this is our final slide, I think. Uh, this is just about using uh, social media for added exposure. Mm. Um, so, yeah, Lorna always talking about that long game there and valuing your relationships. Um, but you also say that, you know, things can change as they go along, don't you? That, that you know, yeah, of course you need to ride the wave, you said. Yeah, you kind of do a little bit. Going back to what we said about the point break of, you know, you know, you are, you become almost embedded in the surfing community on Instagram. You know who's playing the game. You can see after three months of engaging with enough influencers, because you will start with one or two and then you'll see that they're friendly with two others and you'll be following them and then you'll get chatting and you might all have common interests or you know, it's still relationships, people buy from people, Instagrammers are people. So I think once you've got that um, that dialogue on social media then you will start to identify, yep, the rising stars, the people that are flying that are growing in numbers very quickly. You might even spot one that's maybe buying their influencer, their reach, their likes, their followers. But you'll all know because you'll have been on there every day, so you know the changes, the shifts, if things are, you know, the pattern. Certainly I use um, apps to track um, both my own engagement and following, but also other influencers because I like to keep abreast of what's happening. So I would definitely be um, subscribing to websites like, I don't know, Social Blade. Um, you know, those, those apps actually track a follow a account, you know, every day, how many likes, follows. It's really important to know. Mm -hmm. You know, as a brand, you need to know who's up to what. But also as an influencer, I need to know who my competition is. And sometimes, you know, there's certain influencers out there that have grown dramatically, and quite rightly so, because they're delivering strong content, they're getting reshared. Yeah, actually we're um, going to talk about your growing on social media because your growth was unusual. Absolutely was. I was very fortunate because I was, um, at the time I started on Instagram, I did all the right things. I was engaging heavily. I created a lot of um, unique content. And so I was put on the Instagram suggested users list. So I grew from maybe 5,000 to 50,000 followers within two weeks. The negative impact of that was that because I'd been put on this list, the, the kind of audience that I was receiving were very varied, maybe not great for you know a, a ladies' wear brand that wants to sell a certain kind of product because they were all so split up. Mm. And so then I had to work on you know getting to 400k of building strong you know identity so that people follow me, knowing exactly what they're going to get. So that's one thing to be aware of. You know those kind of Fluctuations. Those fluctuations mm -hmm. and why they happened. And yeah, you can be suspicious then. But also, for me, the, one of the reasons I was put on that list is because I was creating very valuable content. And so as a brand, they're the kind of influencers you want, those influencers that can generate beautiful imagery. Mm. And the certainly I had a strategy. I wanted to grow and I realized that resharing imagery would help me grow. So I wanted other accounts to reshare my image and credit me for it. And that is my strategy has been since, you know, 50K and it's working. And as a brand, that could be something to consider as well. You know, choosing to work with influencers who have image, images that are reshareable because you end up becoming part of the circle of, you know, reshared content. You know, you might have a viral image that goes on Tumblr, it appears on websites. You use, you use, some of my images are used in the Australian, the Times. And, you know, I'm wearing Donna Ryder denim jeans, Excellent. which is one of your clients. You know, you can then, you know, like we say, talk about that, retweet it. It's all about sharing the images. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I think finding influencers that create great pictures is really important. Really important. And then getting that um, 
the ROI is so like making sure that whatever you're doing, you know, if you're spending money on images, that you're getting that R, you know, the um, return yeah. on investment and getting the customers um, as well. Um, so we really we would like talking about social media being a business, aren't we? And it's all about you know you know your reach and mm -hmm. you know your impressions, you know your time to post, um, and you also say that it's it is about social, um, but it's almost more social than it is media. Yeah, of course it is. I mean, I spend half the amount of time um, taking cute pictures and um, editing them as I do engaging. So I would say for you know even for a brand, anyone that's prepared to spend three hours you know, creating the imagery. They should be spending six hours engaging, interacting, following, understanding, reading, seeing what conversations are happening. Um, and that's the most important, you know, yeah, the key is social, not media. Mm. And that's not to say that media is not important, it's just the social element is why certain accounts grow at a greater rate because they are so uh, aware, everyone's aware of them. You can't, you can't, get, you can't get away from me. I follow 900 people on Instagram and I engage with all 900 of them. It's a job for me. Yeah. <laughs> but that's really important. Um, and look, you know, the brand, you want to look for those influencers, those super influencers that are very engaged. And then, so yeah, so just to sum up really, it's about uh, keeping relevant, um, being unique, and yeah. like constantly reassessing what's working. Um, and also, uh, Lorna talks a lot about influencers that have that extra bit of charisma as well because yeah. they become the people who are the goals you know, social media goals. Yeah, especially if you're meeting them. So like London centric bloggers, certainly we network with a lot of influencers and we know the ones that are great fun that, you know, in really real life. Will actually come for a drink and maybe stay for another. Um they're quite you know, yeah, not it, it has to be a network of people that you get on with, that you enjoy. And I'm sure it's much like the old school days of PR where people would go and play golf and do business on the golf course. Okay. You know, a lot of our business and our ideas and our creativity gets done. You know, having coffee meetings, Pretty going sure. for brunch, taking pictures of our avocado on toast. Yeah. It all adds to it, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, yeah, but I think it's nice to mix with the, the influences with charisma, ideally. And then, so probably just the last point then, three months is probably what we would say is like a, a good engagement time yeah. three months before minimum. you would kind of approach someone with an email or, you know, um, to work together just on social media. Yeah, because you'll know them by then. You'll know everything about that person. You'll have sussed out their, you know, how much they've grown, what kind of things they like, what they like to eat for dinner. You'll know what kind of clothes they wear. You'll to order them a cocktail. And a yeah, cocktail. and you'll have commonality. So when you have that email, you'll have something to talk about and you'll know the way they are. And it'll be more like, uh, oh my God, how have, we not, how have we not spoken already? Yeah. And that feels really natural and it's a great opener to, to doing business. Okay. Great. Thank you. And um, I have to say, you've not only brought the subject to life, but there's some um, really important detail in there. I'm going to ask um, Claire and Lorna some questions now. I'm going to kick off with a couple, um, but what I would say is, if you've got questions for Claire and Lorna, please send them in. Use the panel on the right-hand side of your screens uh, and send those through, and we will get through as many of them as possible in the next 10 minutes or so. Um, I'm going to start though. Uh, Claire, if I can bring that up. I'm loving all the things about cocktails and avocado and toast and everything else, but I want to bring us back to one of your slides where you talked about business objectives. Yeah. And the very first point where you talked about um, it was really important before engaging with an influencer to understand your objectives. Mm -hmm. And you listed exposure, brand awareness, content, sales, as all sorts of possible objectives. Are they mutually exclusive? And um, we did talk about this a bit earlier, didn't we? Yeah, I think they ha they almost change. This changes, doesn't it? Yeah. Through the course of the relationship, because obviously your objectives will change. Yeah, um, a brand's uh, objectives can change as much as a blogger's yeah. objectives can change. And also, the influencer can have more value, you know, in certain times of their career. Just like the brand can have more, um, you know, need for an influencer, more need to work with an influencer than, you know, certain times of the year. Yes. We look sure. at like, you know, I give an example of Fashion Week, you know, all of a sudden, you know, influencers become very valuable because we, get, we become photographed, we get more airtime in press. If you're looking for press coverage, um, then there's a, you know, there's, and then all of a sudden it goes quiet. So the week after Fashion Week, it's like, where's everyone gone? <laughs> um, I'm going on holiday. <laughs> but, um, 
yeah, it's no. I think it's knowing what each other needs and being able to be honest and say, well, tell me what you're doing right now. What, yeah, you know, and probably a bit flexible and understanding yeah. I suppose, as well. And say, so, like, well, look, we've got no budget now or we haven't got any interest in, you know, sharing anything for the next six months. Mm. But I might, you know, have an idea or creative outlet. And, you know, it's very much a relationship. Like any relationship, you need different things through the course of the, you know, the time that you're together. And, and it seems to be um, a key message of, of all of your presentation is that these things change over time. A relationship's really important. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and the bit that, that um, particularly um, came through as a practical piece of advice is, for instance, you know, get involved on social media, understand your influencers, and this line about three months before you, you yeah. start making contact is such a, a practical nugget of advice <laughs> of saying, well, actually, there are, there are stages in a relationship, yeah. and we'd like to get there. Well, I just feel as though some people will say, well, hang on, is social media and influencers, are they, are they different topics? But as far as I'm concerned, any influencer out there right now, their, their quickest way of getting to their audience is on social media. And we live in an age now where people are on their phones so often, and of course, it's not as, it's not as easy to read a blog as it is to go on Twitter on a feed or look at Instagram and have that instant image. So most, most influencers taking it as a business want to be on social media and so as a brand you need to be engaging with us on social media because that's where we're going to be we're going to be watching what people are saying what they're doing you know I use I use social media as a gauge to what I'm going to wear tomorrow and mm. um, once I know what my audience likes so I think it's really fundamental that you're engaging with them and the three-month thing is it's a personal opinion but I've, I can't imagine it has ever had a no, I think negative. doing your research in, in any field, like whether it's a journalist, influencer, even a celebrity, like if you've not done your research before you fire off that email, yeah. you won't get the response. You won't, it's almost pointless email. Yeah. Um, so it's always worth doing your research, it's no matter what field it's in. There's a great question here which, which has been sent in actually on that point, which um, I think is to, um, and forgive the pun, is to try and stop a pointless contact but to maintain engagement. So, Lorna, should I come to you first? I'll read it out, the question, um, and it is, how can I approach a blogger with whom I worked in the past when I have nothing new for him? I don't want to waste his time, but I also don't want to lose the contact. Well, isn't that exactly how we kind of became friends? Um, Claire didn't have any business for me. I think that you need to be honest, and if you're engaging with them on social media, and if you've known them from the past and you're following them and you comment on their pictures and you engage with their Twitter, they become your mate anyway. So then it's not abnormal to have that relationship. Mm. Sedu seduction, you know, seduce them, um, become their friend. And that's people buy from people. People want to talk to people. Influencers like the sound of their own voice. I'm that person, but we also like to have our, we, you know, my interaction is very valuable to me. Brands will work with me based on my interactions. If you're engaging with me, you're adding value to my brand before you've even asked of anything. So I think it's a really, it's a you know, it's a, the the person that asked that question, yeah, just start following them on all their platforms and actually start chatting to them and um, yeah, about absolutely point. nothing other than what they're talking about. So you know, yeah, you can easily keep on someone's radar without having to send a big email like, absolutely. how are you? What are you doing? It's more like you can just yeah, it's very casually. Normal there until the right time comes along. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't have to be a formal approach. Mm -hmm. It's very much about, as you say, engagement and keeping them yeah. in touch. Great. Um, one, one thing that you both talked about uh, across the presentation is about brands and, and about businesses that may already have existing challenges. So we've got a question that's been sent in about a business that hasn't launched yet. Okay. So um, Claire, maybe I'll come to you first on this uh, with your PR and influencer hat on. Uh, and the question is, Let's say you are launching a business and are very, I can't quite read that, are very quiet about it. Yeah. How do you actually go about exposing your business? This is a business not launched. Um, I would say it probably depends on what the business is also um, because you want to think about your, gym, like your launch strategy altogether. So it depends how you're going to launch it to the public. You know, are you going to do a big stunt? Are you going to do a big party? Are you just going to open the door? Is it, is it a shop? Is it online? Um, is it built yet? A lot of people start businesses off before the website's ready, and that can create all kinds of 
problems, but presumably it's a, some kind of product if you're keeping it under wraps, um, or maybe it's a restaurant or something. Um, but I'd go about probably um, getting a bit of a launch party and getting your social media accounts ready and then launching it when it's time. Um, you can put content on there before, um, but just not kind of um, anything specific. So maybe, you know, you just maybe put the logo up, you know, do a bit of a teaser, follow really people. Oh, let's have a disagreement. <laughs> you could, it depends how you, it depends I, on your strategy. If, you're, if you are a restaurant, for example. Yeah, I just feel with social media that there's no time like the present. Like, and certainly if you want to build your social media platforms and you don't want to share your brand, or your business plan. There's nothing to stop still resharing, reusing, repurposing other people's content. There's nothing I like Predator. more than when somebody shares my content. So whether you're a restaurant and you're sharing, you know, minimalist pictures of, I don't know, rooms and white walls, or you know, there's always a way in. You need a stamp on all the all the platforms. It just depends how ready you are, though, because just putting out things that are not relevant... But you can change could, your strategy. You can change you can your change, visuals. It depends on your launch, though, because, you know, having your own content is, is just the best thing altogether. If, if the case is that you don't want a platform, you don't want social media for the business itself, there's nothing to stop you having a personal page so that you can start to chat with the influencers and the PR and create, you know, the sort of point break, create the dialogue. Because certainly, I'd say probably eight to ten brands that I work with now weren't brands when I started knowing them on social media. They were just normal people that just used to like, you know, like and comment on my pictures. And of course, at that point, when they go, "Oh my God!" So I've just started a swimwear brand. Um, Babe, will you wear my you know, bikini? And you know, it's, of course I will. Yeah, we're friends. We've known each other for ages. It's about relationships. So I feel as though. Whether you're going to put your social media as personal or your uh, brand, you still need to be on social media chatting. So any brand out there that's thinking, I'm going to wait to launch my social media when my brand launches, I just want to like shake them. Because there's no time like the present and you're waste your time wasting at a time when everyone lives on social media. But you could have like the founders or whatever could be on social, exactly. but the brand, obviously, if he's trying to keep it secret, that's a bit tricky. I mean, if he's scared about the fact that when he launches his brand, he's, he's got no followers, no engagement, no nothing. Um, that brings me back to my personal strategy, which is to have a visual mood board of things that you're interested in. You, know, you might be a Tumblr fan and you like okay. pictures of girls wearing, you know, ripped denim, whatever. Um, <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's the fact that you've got a page there. And you can select, you know, any person that's setting out as a brand on a journey may change their aesthetic. I change my aesthetic all the time. So people won't judge you on that. Um, but it's so I think it's so important to have something out there ready to go. So, so does that mean that the, the influencers are only in social media. So there's there's a question here which is about um, things outside of social media. So the, the question is, can you comment about the other influencer types that aren't just social media? Like journalists? Um, yeah, certainly I, I go to show at Fashion Week and I sit on the front row with you know people that have got no following and probably only do Twitter. Um, and they don't know what Instagram is, but they're great influencers and they're recognized within their field and they probably do speeches and talks. And they can put things in print, which is yeah. you know rare these days. So it's but they might not be the person that's going to tag your brand and say I'm wearing this today, um, and there's value in that. And that's how I became a business. That's how my business is built on me, not just doing something, but actually talking about it at the same time. Um, so yeah, certainly you want all of those aspects covered, and you know you'll agree with me, Claire, that when you do events, some of the people that turn up to your events are. You know the editor of a magazine, but or the you know the associate editor of a magazine who literally will never write a piece on you know I go on trips all the time with associate editors that will never write any article on that brand, but it's good it's good networking, it's good you know creative mm -hmm. sort of talking and be, being in their mainframe. I personally I can only speak from experience. Obviously, I'm my influencer as an influencer. That is what I do. I, I wear something or I talk about it and I go to an event and then I speak about it. So maybe that's more about whoever's looking to work with an influencer, what kind of influencer are you looking to work with? Yeah, because um, I'd say with, with journalists, with press, it's the same set of rules really. You do your research, 
um, you you know make sure that your product is right for them. You know you don't want to send something about jewelry if it's a tractor magazine. Mm. Um, so you need to make sure you know what you're talking about. Um, and also you know inviting people to events, but you know they are they are a different kind of influencer, and it's um, you know journalism goes back a bit further than mm, okay. um, digital does. And it's not to say, you know, like you said, you all go on trips together. They, of course, mix in the same circles. Um, but you can't sometimes always see physically on, you know, on Instagram that person's influence. Like Lorna said, that's why they're on the front rows. And, uh, you know, they're very influential people. But it might not convert in the way you expect it to or that you can see now because Instagram is so much faster and, mm. you know, more obvious that um, journalists are still a big you know, and press and different influences, you know, influences that don't even write for the press that, you know, wear something or in, in, in a circle of friends or in a society and they get seen and that's how, you know, trends start and, you know, you, there are different levels of influences for sure. Um, but the digital ones, it's very interesting game because it's, you know, it is immediate. You do get it straight away and you do get the tag and it's very exciting. So mm. um, there's all different kinds of levels. Yeah. Um, you both were very clear on... Um, what I would call almost influencer etiquette, the way to approach them, uh, the sort of things not to put in emails, which I thought was uh, two great examples of practical tips. Uh, we've got a question about uh, a, a tricky piece of influencer etiquette, I think. Uh, so, Lorna, I may come to you with this first. Uh, and the question is, what if I already had a meeting with an influencer, agreed on a subject that is of interest to both, but I've been postponed? How do I bring up the subject without stressing out the person in question? Um, it's quite vague, actually, that question for me, but I'm going to try and work it out in my head what you're actually saying to me. So you've met with them, you've gone for, say, lunch, and you've discussed a topic, and then they've gone quiet. So clearly... I don't know if, I don't know if it's like maybe the brand's been postponed. Oh, OK. It depends on how you read it. I think, I'll tell you what, I could read it a third way, which okay. is the meeting was agreed, it was around on a, su a subject, oh, and the meeting's being pursued. Oh, okay. And yet, clearly, someone wants to, to well, read this is pe This is people to people, isn't it? Like, call them. Be straightforward and yeah, email them advice, and ask, yeah. are they okay and when they're going to be free again? I do this all the time, actually, as an influencer. I'm forever either turning up to meetings. As, as creatives, I feel as though a lot of influencers are actually quite. Um, rubbish when it comes to timekeeping and doing things so I like I love it when I'm meeting with someone the day before they email me to remind me and then on the morning they email me again to remind me um, if they've gone quiet or they've cancelled or they've not turned up get back on social media and start engaging with them like a normal person again yeah if, um, it's, if it's the project that's been postponed I wouldn't worry about that I'd just tell them as quickly and briefly as possible and just be positive I think as long as you're positive and yeah and honest about things um, it's usually, yeah, transparency is pretty much key, isn't it? It really is, yeah. And if they're not being transparent with you, if you read it the other way, then do you really want to work with them anyway? Yeah, just be upfront as possible because it saves a lot of hassle later on. You know, things can go badly wrong if people haven't been super clear from the outset, I think. Yeah, I agree. Great. We've got a question here about the sort of tools to keep on tabs, uh, to keep tabs on influencers. Um, you both sort of obviously keep track of influencers yeah. um, because Lorna, as you were saying, even your sort of peers or the people in your influencer tribe, you'd like to know what they're up to and, yeah. uh, and how they're doing. So this question is, are there any automated ways you've found to identify relevant influencers? I think Lorna, you did mention one piece of technology that you use. Um, yeah, so I use Social Blade, but again, that wouldn't identify a specific category of influencer. That will literally tell you statistics, their growth rate, how they're growing over a yearly period compared to other influencers. It's a good way of comparing. Um, but there are other websites. There's, there's ones that I've been featured in. I, I don't want to say who they are because I actually don't believe they're as accurate as maybe they are pertaining to be by virtue of the fact that I'm, I know where I appeared on that rank and I was a little bit higher up than a certain other, and I knew that, you know, obviously I would never say anything, but I thought, I mean, that isn't right. I would say if you're networking and you've identified, you know, between two to five influencers that are of interest to you anyway, if you've been doing your three months social media nattering, you'll know way more than that by the end. And they'll probably lead you, like, on peeling the onion, they'll lead you through, mm -hmm. the, you know, to other influences of the same ilk and topic and interest.
But I also think it's really valuable if you've spotted an influence that you really like, um, just to see who's talking about them, who's resharing their content. Because that can sometimes lead you to, mm. certainly for me, that's, I look at influencers to see who's resharing them, and then I try and look at the brands that are resharing them, and I think, oh, I'm going to go to that brand because they've worked with this person, so they might want to work with me. So it's almost being like a Sherlock Holmes in a way. <laughs> and social media makes it very easy to do that, which is why I champion it so much. But you're sort of saying that also it's not really automated. Again, part of this is organic as well. Absolutely. Okay. What no, about you, Claire? We were, just, we were saying yesterday there's not really any shortcuts. It is quite a long game in a lot of yeah. ways because you have to put the work in. Um, but, yeah, from from a brand perspective, um, we don't use any like automated stuff. I obviously, use Golkana. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, I think in general, like I find a lot of the social media influencers through, you know, picking up magazines or, you know, it's not just about being on Instagram and looking, you know, you can find things from other ways, you know, who's maybe guest blogging on somewhere or, you know, on, you know, look up the Guardian or um, other platforms and, and that, that can bring other people into your circle as well just by looking around. I know that there's a big, um, probably going a bit off topic here, but in YouTube at the minute a lot of influencers are very upset about the fact that um, YouTube, the technology is so advanced that if somebody has searched for a specific influencer, other influencers that talk about the same things, that maybe do the same things, will appear in the, in the bar beneath. Of course, as an influencer you don't want people being driven to traffic um, you know, that is literally your competition. yeah your competition. Mm. So you know maybe that that will happen. Certainly with Instagram, you follow one person, there's a drop down to say you might want to follow this person or that person. So the technology is there, um, but I think if you're doing it in the most organic way, you'll get the most organic results. Sure. Great. We've got time, I think, for one last question, uh, and this one's really about content and uh, credit. Uh, and uh, I think sharing as well. So let's finish with, with, with this question about content and um, I, think, I think it's really about how you get people to share and, and the right level of content there. So should we start again? Lorna, you, you've mentioned this. I'll, I'll read out the question first. Um, did you mean get influencers to share your images and credit or the other way around in order to get good content to share with your audience? Where, do you, where does this exchange work, and between brands and, and influencers, you know, who's best to produce the content? You clearly uh, put a premium on producing great photography mm -hmm. and making sure that you have the tools and the ability to do that. Yeah. Um, and you've said more influencers do that now than have before, but not everyone does. How, how's the interchange? Well, certainly, if a brand came to me and said, I want you to share our, our assets, our content, that's a very different, you know, I'm not a magazine, I'm not an advertorial. So that's a very unusual approach, per se. But for me, I'm, what I'm suggesting by resharing content is that if you're working with influencers who, gen who actually create content, that is resharable. And that is actually a very viable thing. You have. mean, like, you mean people um, resharing your image on their own Instagram account, don't you? That's yeah, you so... And also, I'm, I think I put I, the the reason why I think it's important to have these images that are shared and shared and shared, and we you know we go just, it gets your your aesthetic to the wider audience. The only downside to that is that once my image is reshared, not necessarily is it credited. And if I've not been credited, then you know it's very unlikely that you're going to get credited. So there's a fear factor then, isn't there? That the asset lose, it, lose control of it. Yeah, it? loses all control, and you don't know where that asset is going to appear. But I just feel as a, I don't know if I'm going off piece here with the answer, but I feel as though as a as an influencer, there are types of influencers. I am one of them who actually actively create images that I know will be reshared, and that is part of my strategy, both for growth but also for brand awareness. Um, and as a brand, you need to know who those influencers are. And it's very easy to find them because, of course, you can see where their images are being reshared by virtue of the fact they get, you know, some of them get tagged or you see them online, on Pinterest, on Tumblr. Um, it's, a, it's a tricky one, really, but just from a, as a brand coming to me, I would never want to be asked to share a brand's content. I would always want to create my own unique content. But I can I could see brands expecting that. I mean, Claire, in your experience, do brands understand that? Are they getting to understand that? Um, I think so. I think um, 
I think it's just a bit of a whole new world for brands, especially, you know, new brands that are up and coming or even, you know, brands that have been around for a long time and it's digital, the whole new world. So there's definitely been a bit of uh, trying to get to grips with it. But I do think that, you know, original content goes a lot further than um, taking content from other places. But I understand, like, that's a slightly different thing with the re um, yeah. resharing thing. Um, so brands, you know, would probably reshare, like Lorna's image, for example, Donna Ryder shares your images. Yeah. So that's kind of another way of, of sharing it back. But, um, yeah, if you can create your own original stuff, it, it definitely gives you that brand identity then. You know, you've got your clear USP. You can really see all your, you know, everything you do is really on brand, isn't it? Yeah. But as a brand, a brand must credit the, yes. you know. Always. And sometimes brands ask for the high-res image. So they may then want to use it on, you know, um, if they're sending out messages, email, you know, email content, newsletters. As long as you're asked for that, obviously it's a very different ballgame when you start using people's images in advertorials and press. And then, obviously, uh, you know, it's a completely different topic. Yeah, because pre uh, press do look for those <clears throat> inspirational images and they do look for those street star shots. And it is known that people will ask for a picture that's been used on Instagram, that's a hundred percent can happen. Um so it's that's why it's important to you know, if you can take them as high res, you know, take them high res, don't just do them on the phone, uh, because then they can be used in other ways. Um but, but at least, you know, they're not going to get very far with screenshotting your image. Yeah. You can't print that much on a billboard. No that's billboard. Very true. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a great phrase that I always think helps with this and you know, when I did my journalism training a long time ago it was always taught to us, which was, you know, treat others as you'd want to be treated yourself and particularly with content if you're sharing other people's content if you're reusing something of course give a credit you'd expect that to happen to you so I think that's always a good rule of thumb I have to say though we've covered so much ground um, but that also means we've run out of time <laughs> so I want to thank everyone for sending in their questions um, there have been some great questions um, and has covered such a diverse area but of course I want to finish by thinking, thanking Claire and Lorna uh, for firstly, all their answers to those questions. I think a few of them um, put you on the spot, but um, thank you so much for that. And of course, for the presentation and, and really giving us a mix of um, an overview, background, some rules and guidelines to sort of live by, but also some very, very practical advice and tips. Um, really do watch out for those uh, two lines to avoid in email. And, uh, and of course, remember the three-month rule but there was a lot there, and of course, uh, we will be sharing the slides and uh, making a recording of the webinar available. So, um, thank you both. Um, we hope that everyone listening in enjoyed the webinar, and please do keep your eyes peeled for the next in our Cision webinar series. Um, thank you for everyone, to everyone who's been able to join us, uh, and I hope you'll join us next time. The webinar is now over. <laughs> <laughs>